buying a property in Spain. There are many reasons to purchase a property in Spain. The climate, the food, the culture, or simply to enjoy life. If you already see yourself buying the house of your dreams in the Mediterranean, it is important to be cautious and follow a series of steps. First, prepare a budget and take into account all the possible expenses. Remember to add transfer tax or VAT to the sale price, as well as legal fees, notary fees and land registry fees. And even if it was love at first sight, do not rush or sign anything. The most important thing, especially if you're not yet a Spanish resident, is to hire an independent lawyer. A specialist who speaks your language and solely defends your interests. Together, you can review the characteristics of the house, should it have pending charges, negotiate a mortgage with the banks, and you will always be up to date throughout the whole process. But most importantly, fall in love with your property and do things by the book. Your new life starts there. Payether and Aredia, International Lawyers. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching us in this special webinar that we have today, on 19th of October, 2022. We have a special webinar because we are gonna stay longer than we do it normally. Today, we're gonna stay two hours because we want to help you and we want to inform you some special topics that we understand is gonna um, uh, uh, teach you in order to, well, to you understand the three pillars that we understand, the foreigners, the expats, wants to now before coming to Spain. One of them is buying the property in Spain. The other one is immigration issues, it's especially important, uh, no look at the visa and the golden visa, and taxes, whenever someone becomes resident in Spain, who have to um, understand the consequences of being resident in Spain. So uh, before we uh, start uh, with the buying the property in Spain, that will be the first topic that we are gonna speak. I would like to present some uh, expert lawyers that we have is joining us, Ignacio Pellicer and Michael Davis. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Michael, are you there? Yes. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> you made it. Thank you, everyone. I see you. Where, where okay. are you from today? <laughs> Great. Okay. Ignacio and Michael will uh, explain us about buying a property in Spain for the first half hour. Then we will go through the immigration issues the following hour and the taxes. And obviously, we will be answering you all the questions you may have. So please. Make all the questions you have because we will be answering you. And this is why uh, on the resource that we have extended the webinar in order to answer the questions that you have and we understand are very important for you. Okay, well, we're going to start with a video of a client that uh, had experience on coming into Spain in order to um, well, buy a property in Spain about consequences of immigration and about taxes. After that, we will be explaining, Michael will be explaining us about the process of buying a property in Spain. Eggs, we, we get everything. Produce, it's In, just everything's fresh. It's the best apartment. Oh, okay. Excellent. Most appealing about the Mercado for me is, as our daughter says, see that that tuna, like a big tuna fish laying there? <laughs> and I'll say, yeah, and she'll say, eight hours ago, that was out there swimming. And then the oranges from Valencia are wonderful. Yeah. It's frightening how much more affordable it is to live in Spain as it is in the United States. 
473 euro for one year for our property taxes. Our last property tax bill in the US for a very nice but modest home was $12,000 US. Well, so that's a big difference. Yeah. And when you retire, you have to make your money last. So for us, we can travel and have a wonderful life. Okay, thank you, uh, everyone. Okay, well, let's start Ignatio and Michael. Michael, I will let you, I mean, just you start explaining a little bit about the process of buying a property in Spain. And after that, obviously, Ignacio and myself will be joining about questions and answers that we have in the chat. And, um, and obviously, I speak about uh, the process of our experience. And obviously, I would like you both that you have a, had a really good experience in the last week about many buyers that bought properties in Spain. And at the end, because of the bankruptcy, because some situations where some money um, at the end uh, blocked, frozen by a developer, but at the end, you have had like, really good consequences and you have uh, get all the money for the clients. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Pedro, very much. Uh, uh, I will just pass over to Michael, who is going to explain uh, how to buy a property in Spain a safe way. Uh, we are very happy, Pedro, that after 14 years, we managed to uh, get a case, a court case sorted uh, from some buyers who didn't do their homework at the time in the credit, well, actually, when it was the, the boom, actually. And they had the bank guarantees and uh, the builder went bankrupt. Uh, then the credit crunch started. And then we've been fighting, Michael and myself, the two law firms together, trying to get all their money back. And we finally made it after so long. So, um, Michael, we're very, very happy. And I think we should share these with the audience so they could do things by the book. Yeah, over to you, Michael. Hi, Matthew. The first thing is, is that we, we owe ourselves a celebration lunch <laughs> that we haven't had to be ha been able to have yet. For those of you that don't know, Ignacio works up in Valencia region and uh, we work down here in the, in the Costa del Sol. So we don't, uh, we're not always, always together, even though we're on with these webinars together. Yes. Yeah, so th this case that we have just uh, recently won last last week, the clients all got their money. Um, it's been going on for 11 years. It's been the longest, longest case that we've had in the office. I've sort of had we got used to living with this case over the years. It's going to be sad almost not to see, to, you know, to, to work on it a little bit every week for the, as we're doing for the last 11 years. All worked out well. Um, basically, clients that put money down on a property under construction, um, probably 13 or 14 years ago, maybe confused. I know we started about 11 years ago on the on the case. These clients, unfortunately, uh, did not buy uh, using a lawyer. That, uh, they didn't have bank guarantees on the stage payments. So when the builder went bust, basically it all turned into a mess. But anyway, in this case, it's all worked out. Uh, well, <laughs> okay, so I won't, we won't brag anymore, Ignacio. Uh, we do have to have that celebration lunch. And uh, yes. let's go through the buying process because they're really, if you do things correctly, there is no risk of falling into one of these uh, situations. So just to go through things quickly, if you want to buy a property in Spain, the first thing I would say is take a careful uh, uh, look uh, at where you want to buy. Different regions of Spain offer very different things. So uh, I do recommend traveling around. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's different. We're down, we're down in Marbella, you know, the Costa del Sol, Ignacio and Pedro are both up in the Valencia region. They've got various offices up there. We've got very offices down here. Both regions are fantastic. You won't go wrong in either of these two regions. They're both uh, they're both incredible, uh, but they've both got different things. They're not 100% the same in one area to the other. So check them out to see which is the one that you like best. Okay, so once you've found, uh, you Michael, found yes, Michael, be before you go, uh, I think for you and us, it's obvious that uh, doing things by the book is, is, is correct, is proper, it's not safe, but unfortunately, sometimes people just get themselves lost uh, in what the due diligence are. And, and yes. it's so important yes. to avoid all these court cases that we went through, which yeah. unfortunately yeah. will carry on going yeah. through. But That's I it. think we should this over to you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so buying in Spain is 
uh, can that say the same is that say it can be 100% safe. It just you have to follow a process and you have to hire a lawyer to to, to handle the process for you. It sounds like we're trying, you know, we're we're sort of drumming our own drums here, but, but basically it is true. So the first thing is find the region where you want to buy the property, uh, then work on finding the property that you like. Uh, via estate agents, uh, via the different websites, that there are the big estate uh, websites that offer lots of properties. Um, while you're doing that, I would definitely recommend to start, start working on finding a good lawyer for yourself. Um, we've done various videos on you know, how to do this and we go into the detail. But basically, I'd say, look at the consular websites. They normally have a list of recommended uh, lawyers, uh, English speaking, etc. Uh, they never say that they recommend them because obviously there's a responsibility thing, but basically the ones that are on the list of normally lawyers that have been around for a long time are sort of on the on the on the circuit of lawyers that we, you know, Ignacio or me and Pedro all know and that would, would, would do, do a good job. Um, the other way, you know, ask around other people that have that have bought uh, bought a property in Spain. If you come across someone that tells you that they, they used a lawyer that recommended not to buy something, well, that's that's probably a treasure. Go go. That's probably a good sign that the lawyer was a, a good one. So, as I say, we've done videos specific on how to find a good lawyer. I just do do what I basically say is do dedicate some time to finding a good lawyer. Um, nowadays, there's no excuse. Uh, to not find one. There are plenty of very good English speaking lawyers all along the coast. Um, uh, so yeah, so there's no, there's no reason not to find one. And it's also easy to have a first meeting with a lawyer nowadays, because even if you're not in the country, in the UK, have a word with them. Uh, uh, they can probably offer you a Zoom consultation to go through things with them. I know Ignacio and Pedro both offer this service of the Zoom consultation, initial consultation. We do as well. And so you can meet up, see, see if you like them. So once you've found the property that you want, you've got your li lawyer lined up. The next thing is, once you've found the property, don't hand over any money. Speak to the lawyer and let the lawyer take over. So he'll organize powers of attorney, he'll ask for the basic documentation, and he'll move towards a deposit contract. So a deposit contract, you'd hand over 10% and you set a, a, a no later than completion date. Your lawyer then, with powers of attorney, that can be organized both in Spain while you're here, or they can send the documentation back to the UK. Um, they will then organize your NIE numbers and all the basic searches on the property so that you can move towards the signing of the title deed. The normal completion uh, 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 time scale to expect is basically, we say anywhere up to three months would be normal. Longer than that can be done, but it's not the normal. And less than three months would also sort of be exceptionally little time. But basically, if push comes to shove, we could complete on a property in Spain within about a month. If, if, if it was needed. Um, that's it. The lawyer will also take care of opening up your Spanish bank account, uh, put you through money laundering compliance. And uh, basically, if you've got a good lawyer, he'll just take over, go through the process with you, and, and it will all be, uh, um, all be, all be uh, easy. As I say, if you're buying down here in the Marbella area or in anywhere along in Andalusia, you can give us a call. We offer a consultation. Uh, in our case, we do charge for the initial consultation. We think we, we during that consultation, we give very valuable advice because we'll go through the whole process, answer all your questions, spend an hour with you. And after that, you may choose to use us or maybe not, but it gives us a chance to, to meet each other and go through things. Uh, in Nathio and Pedro, I know you offer initial consultations as well. I don't know if you charge for them or not, but it's on a case to case. To case. Um, but that's definitely a good idea. I'd say try and meet up with the lawyer that's going to handle the purchase for you before you find the property so that he's all just ready to go. And also he may be able to keep you away from, you know, maybe there's a dodgy estate agent or dodgy, whatever. You can tell him who it is or whatever. And he may give you some valuable sort of local advice. So it's a, just a good thing. Then after you've met, you've purchased the property, you need to make sure that you uh, do Spanish wills. Your lawyer will, will tell you all about that. And then your lawyer will also discuss with you, you know, your residency, non-residency situation and the implications of doing one, doing the other. Uh, perhaps also we could also look into the possibility of a golden visa if you're buying a, a more expensive property. The, we've got the expert with us here with golden visas, uh, Pedro Heredia, probably one of the, the, the best, uh, well, the most expert per, uh, lawyers on, on the subject of golden visas in Spain. I know he does probably more than anyone else. 
Um, so uh, maybe you can talk about that. Um, and I think that's just it in a very quick uh, uh, run through of what actually takes uh, takes place. Thank you, Michael. Let me let me ask you some questions. Obviously, Ignacio, I'm sure that you would like to add something. But there are questions that probably are basic questions, but I understand are important questions that clients are saying. You have said about find a good lawyer. I mean, that this means that the lawyers are independent because we always say about this independence as a must for, for lawyers. But what do you think about it? I mean, this is, is not just a good lawyer, but also, also independent lawyer. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Actually, uh, Mike and all ourselves, so we've been just promoting all the time for people to choose two things by the book and, it, and choose an independent lawyer. Why do we say this? Because the lawyer that is representing you should fight for you, should look after your interests, should do whatever you is your best interest. Now, if we need to recommend you not to buy the property, then we will, even though it's upsetting, but you might be very grateful in the long run because I might have shared with you that we have a recent case that, that you failed three times and still did not buy a property because the properties, they're all with problems. And actually, we're having here and we're inviting you here in this big webinar, because actually, Pedro, we should share that today we're doing the longest webinar ever due to the high demand exactly. questions. And we're having as a maximum of two hours. So you can please send us all your questions. We've got here the time. And actually, um, one of the situation is you need to find the right lawyer that fights for you and do things by the book. As Michael stated, buying a property in Spain is safe, but you need to do things properly. I've got here, Pedro, uh, one question here from, uh, I think I believe it is just before, so you can organize yourself, we're going to have 15 minutes to talk about uh, property, 15 minutes about the conveyancing process. Then we're going to talk about taxes and immigration issues. Another 15 minutes each. And then we're going to talk about uh, immigration and uh, inheritance tax and wills. So we're going to try to cover everything when you are relocated, because there's certain people just uh, contacting us, Michael, from Texas, from the United States. Uh, and they're very much interested because a lot of Americans are interested now to buy a property in Spain due to the currency exchange um, issue now. And uh, is it uh, the question, Michael, Pedro, is it a good time to buy a property in Spain? Yeah. Well, here we go. We'll discuss that yeah, now Ignacio, in a minute. Ignacio, Ignacio let yeah. me just, I quickly want to say something about what you brought up about the independent lawyer. Um, yes, it's true that the lawyer has to be a good lawyer, but he also has to be uh, in, independent. Now, most, most lawyers, at least the ones that we know, most of them are, are independent. Um, but what we, when we, we've done a couple of videos on good ways and bad ways to choose a lawyer in, in, in Spain. And the biggest mistake that we see as far as the choice of the lawyer is to simply go by the one that's been recommended by the estate agent. Now, that's just not a good idea. It doesn't mean that it's going to turn out wrong for you. It's just that how do you know how much of that lawyer's work is coming from that estate agent and how dependent they may be on that estate agency for their, for their business? Um, so the fact that an estate agent recommends a lawyer isn't necess doesn't necessarily make that lawyer a bad lawyer, but I don't think it's the right way for you to choose the solicitor that handles the purchase for you. Uh, it's true that when you go to small areas, for example, one of our offices is in a beautiful village called Mahaka in, uh, here in Andalusia, and it's a very small place. So there's only about four of us lawyers that are doing all the conveyancing in that area. And the estate agents, when they do the, the short list of lawyers for clients that come in, they often, of course, recommend us and then the, the clients do end up hiring us but, but so it doesn't of course in our case we're good we're good lawyers and we are independent and we can afford to tell the client not to buy uh whatever property the estate agent is is offering but it's just don't base the choice of lawyer on, on who the estate agent recommends there are many many excellent estate agents that wouldn't even market a dodgy property but there are plenty of others that would or even maybe not knowing, not knowing so, they just haven't got the knowledge to not market a, 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 a property that has some problems with it. So, so that's just that's not not the good way. Okay, uh, Michael. Basically, uh, we have the typical case here, and let me just start. Even though we could talk about 
Uh, with regards to buying a property in Spain, I always say here in the Costa Blanca area to budget an average of 13%, okay, on your budget. Okay, whether you buy off land, it will be VAT instead of transfer tax. If is, we're talking about transfer tax, uh, I, I, in general terms, Michael, in these area at the moment, as the law start, stands, I always ask buyers to budget a 13% on top of the property purchase. Mm. Okay, I know in Andalusia now recently, the law changed and is a bit cheaper on that respect, isn't it? Uh, yes, at the moment, uh, when we're talking about secondhand properties, there's a, there's a 3% difference between Andalusia region and the Valencia region. Up there, you're on, I know you pay 10% transfer tax. In Andalusia now, it's it's seven percent, uh, uh, regardless of the value of the property, seven percent transfer tax. We used to have ten percent as well on properties above seven hundred thousand, and below that it was eight percent. So, uh, yeah, so we've got a good deal on, on second-hand properties. On new properties, the difference is not as large because the VAT is the, is, is the same here as up there, and the document tax is one point two up there is one point five. So uh, um, very similar. Yeah, so we've got at the moment it's only the law is only until the end of the year. In other words. In Spain, to have this lower reduced uh, transfer tax of 7%, uh, completion has to be, that's the completion at the notary has to be before the end of the year. Otherwise, we'll go back to the old system, unless they end up extending it, you know, obviously into the new year. But at the moment, that's what the law says until the, the end of the year. Mm. Which is good. I mean, there's another variable that for you to, when you shop around, when you are, because we've got a lot of clients that they're relocating into Spain and sometimes they don't really know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's another factor. Shall I buy here? Shall I buy there? Mm -hmm. It's so subjective, Michael, isn't it? Because sometimes you might think, okay, it's cheap over there, but I like this area. Or probably the property price in one area is cheaper and it doesn't really matter yep. the the expenses. So it's very subjective. Uh, and, and when they say where is best, and I always say shop around, see what you like, yeah. test it, even rent, and just make your own mind and your decision. Because uh, you could be willing to live in a city, you could be willing to live yeah. in a villa. In, in yeah. So... Well, it's so, so subjective to your taste. And sometimes yeah. uh, laws change as later on we'll talk about inheritance tax. And it's, it's hard to make decisions. It's hard to make decisions just based on this. But it's one thing um, yeah. in the list that you should yeah. consider. Enough, that's, enough that's why we, for the last few years, we uh, we offer this uh, um, you know the, the, the purchase of property in Spain initial consultation okay and we we charge for that consultation uh, uh, unlike I know other, some other lawyers don't charge for it we do because we take it very seriously we spend an hour with the client over Zoom or in one of our offices it doesn't matter and we go through all these things because the fact that the transfer tax is different in the regions, that the inheritance tax is different within the regions. So depending on their circumstances, you know, it could be uh, uh, in their particular case, it could be, there could be a big difference in inheritance tax if they buy up in Barcelona or they buy down in Marbella. So we, all that, we explain during our initial uh, consultation. So that's why I always say, find the lawyer before you find the property, before you fall in love with the property and there's no going back <laughs> and your wife basically will not accept you to buy anything else. Let's have a talk yeah. beforehand. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me interrupt you guys and start some questions. But before we answer the first question, I would like you to explain me. I mean, uh, obviously, when someone buys a property at the end, the transmission of the ownership uh, starts and, and the completion and an entry. But what is a notary and what is the property registry? Just to a uh, basic and simple explanation to, to uh, show to the clients. Okay. Right. Is it for Michael, yes? Yeah, for Michael and yourself. Yes, yes. go ahead, Michael. Okay, well, basically, uh, when you purchase a property in Spain, there are various figures. You've obviously got that you've got the solicitor, you've got the notary, and you've got the property register. Okay, so the solicitor is the one that you'll visit initially. He will give you all the advice about your purchase. He will keep you safe. He will make sure everything's in good order, etc. In the In Spain, we have... Uh, uh, the notary. The notary is not the same as in the UK. In Spain, the notary will sit there the day that we complete and he will make sure that the document that we are signing that transfers the property is formally correct and will identify the parties or give the okay to the powers of attorney with which the lawyers are signing, which is the normal on behalf of the, 
of the clients. Now, so he's like a first filter. So after the notary, we have to pay the transfer tax. And the final step, once we've got clearance from the tax office, we have to present it to the property register. And about 35 days later, the registrar will confirm that he has now registered the new ownership. This basically means that in Spain, even if you lost your title deed after the purchase process is complete, it wouldn't matter because your lawyer can always order a, a new ser a search in the property register and you will appear as the owner of that property. That's basically, the, the property register is also the place where your lawyer is handling your purchase, will do all the checks to make sure that the property does, in believe, does, does indeed belong to the seller, uh, that there are no charges on it, no court cases against it, uh, uh, no mortgages, etc. Right, Michael, let me just add one more thing, Pedro. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if Paco could follow me here. Um, actually, this is the typical question, Michael. We are heading... This is when you buy a property in Spain, where there's a second-hand property. Uh, the question, Michael, do I pay the deposit, the 5,000 euros deposit they're requesting? Mm. And what about if they later on, they don't give it back to me? First question you normally will have, the 5,000 euros question, Michael. Then the <laughs> second will be the 10%. Let's talk about the transfer um, second-hand property, and then you'll have here the completion. I, I think you will agree that uh, normally we could complete easily, average Pedro and Michael, in three months' time, okay? Roughly, okay? Uh, it's better not to, not to make general things, but um, I'm talking about a resale property. And uh, one of the questions is, how about if I pay the 5,000 euros and they don't get it back. So sometimes it's, it's catch with the true, Michael, isn't it? Is do I pay, but subject yeah. to my solicitor yeah. Yeah. Uh, inspecting the legalities and you give me money back? Sometimes you have the issue that I don't want to give a deposit, but somebody else could jump over and buy it for you and you lose, yeah. you lose the, the property. So uh, what do you think, Michael? Okay, well, I think this, in other words, all... Lawyers in general and the notaries that when we're all talking, we always talk about the deposit contracts and the completion. So that's the 10% deposit contract and the completion. That's now the thing is that it's uh, that this 5,000 or 3,000, depending on the whim of the estate agent, um, is basically sometimes a necessary evil. Why? Because you, you're you the buyer, you go into the estate agent. The estate agent sees 10 other people all interested in the same property. Lots of people just going, looking at, looking at all sorts of properties all day long. And to differentiate you from those other lots of buyers that you know, are always looking around at the properties, you say you want to buy. They say, OK, but if you want to reserve the property, you've got to hand me 3,000 euro, 5,000 euro. And you say, well, I haven't got time. My lawyer hasn't looked at the paperwork. And the estate agent says, look, if you don't put the reservation down on the property, I'm not going to take it off the market. OK, your lawyer may take now three weeks to look at the paperwork, blah, blah, blah. So very often uh, the three or 5,000 euro is like a necessary evil that people have to sort of put down with the estate agent um, to, so the property can be taken off the market. Um, so what, what happens? Well, normally, I mean, if the estate agent is, um, and basically the agreement that you have internally with the estate agent, if later on your lawyer is not happy with the paperwork, they hand you back your reservation. That would be the sort of underlying uh, agreement with, between you and the agent regarding the, the reservation. So uh, am I, are we completely against these reservations? No, we find that they're very often sort of necessary. We, we understand how all this works. Also, the seller is worried about handing out, getting his solicitor involved and handing all the paper, him talking to the other lawyer, et cetera, before receiving anything on account, because then he'll have to pay his own lawyer for his wheeling and dealing with the other lawyer. So it makes everyone nervous. So what I, what I say about this is sometimes it's necessary easel. So basically what I would do is, if it's possible, if you've already got your lawyer lined up, as you should have, then when you're at the agent and you're facing this difficult situation of deciding what to do with a 3,000 or 5,000 euro, call your lawyer. And if the lawyer sees that that estate agency is one of the estate agencies has been around for a long time, etc., he'll basically probably tell you to go ahead and do it 
on the basis that the estate agent won't want to upset a local lawyer simply for 3,000 3, euro, so it should normally be okay. I know it sounds a bit of a sort of a gray area, this 3,000, 5,000 euro, but that is how it works. Okay, okay. Michael, uh, Pedro, how about buying a property off plan? Uh, I know we have a lot of questions and we need to run. Sorry, We're sorry, running out of sorry enough here. I forgot, uh, uh, very important uh, with this 10%. Just to say that um, the 10% sometimes has to end up going to the actual seller and not to a lawyer. And that has a certain risk involved because the sellers don't have, obviously, insurance on that payment, et cetera, et cetera. So what I say with this is the 10% is the normal, is the normal deposit contract but it can be negotiated. If you're buying a villa that's 2 million euro in Marbella, um, the, the, sellers, the sellers will not expect a 10% deposit. You can get that deposit down and minimize that risk a little bit because the completion of the notary is foul proof. You hand over the draft in exchange for the title deed, but the reservation, the deposit is being held by someone in their account for the two months leading up to completion. If it's a lawyer, no problem. But if it's somebody else, it's better to try and reduce that deposit contract. If possible. Okay, well, thank you, Michael and, and Yethi. Well, let's, let's, let's get some other topics regarding buying a property in Spain, which I would like to, because it's, it's a question many times. It's very basic, but one of the first, th first thing is what it is a NIE number and why it is important. And I would like both of you to give us some tips about why it is important about the process of negotiation on buying a property. What will be your recommendations, you or Michael, about, about the price, about the conditions, about what are the recommendations about the market? Obviously, we are, we are lawyers, but obviously uh, many clients come to us while they are negotiating with the client, with the, with the sellers, what would be your recommendations? First thing, any number, why it is important, and second thing about negotiation on buying a property in Spain. Okay, when we use, we're we talking about buying a property in Spain, you need to have a tax number, okay? I don't need you to stress yourself because of that, but once you appoint the most important thing, your, your, your lawyer, your independent lawyer, he will take care of that. He will just either organize a power of attorney, for him to get the NI number, which is the uh, immigration tax number, so you are able to pay taxes in Spain as a non-resident to start with, or later on it will just turn out into a residency card with the same tax number, okay? That's with regards to, to NI number. And the second question you made, Pedro, was about negotiating. Negotiation, I mean, negotiating the price, or negotiating the property, the conditions, the terms of a buyer. Actually, we really had a, we had these questions a lot, Michael. I don't know whether you have it over there. But in general terms, I always think there is a room to negotiate depending on the price. It's always worth asking the agent to see what is, how, how desperate is the vendor uh, uh, going through. Normally, I would say, Pedro, you could talk through and you have nothing to lose. I consider probably there is always room for negotiating, okay? There's always room, uh, but it depends on personal circumstances and whether the vendors are in a rush or whether or vendors not. are really... Or how much time the property has been unsold, for example, in the market. Okay. Yeah. But you always take the risk of somebody else jumping on and loving that property and make a high offer, which is what happened in one of, of the cases that, you know, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you need to protect yourself very much to, to not fall into a trap. And on the other hand, you don't want to lose the property as long as it's legal. So sometimes it's difficult. I don't know about you, Michael. Well, I, I'd say that uh, uh, regarding uh, negotiation, et cetera, if the clients are used to wheeling and dealing or they've bought and sold properties in, in the UK, basically what's acceptable as a negotiation sort of thing in Spain is very similar on property as it is in the UK. Apart from anything else, many of the sellers of the properties are also going to be probably British like yourselves or, or American, etc. So, uh, yes, it, it's it's rarely does somebody go in and offer the asking price straight away it's, it's very rare normally people will go in with a slightly lower offer but if you go wild then you know it's likely you know if somebody asks for 140,000 euro you go with 100,000 euro uh, don't expect an answer because <laughs> the, the, the seller would feel will feel insulted the same as they would in the UK um, that would sort of be the 
uh, thing. As far as I don't know what happens to you, in our case, we often get clients of ours ask us, can we negotiate the price on their behalf? Well, in our case, we don't. We, we, we don't get involved in the negotiating of the price. With, with the odd exception, somebody could now watch in the webinar and say, oh, but you, in our case, you accepted. They're, they're exceptions. They're only clients that we've dealt with many, many times before. They've already bought lots of, bought and sold lots of properties. And then we sort of feel comfortable doing that sort of thing on their behalf. But otherwise, we prefer just to keep everything just to the legal side of the transaction and let the them and the estate agent do all the wheeling and dealing. Okay, well, we're going to answer some questions here and then we will go through a, a video. Well, first question is for you, Michael. It says, is from uh, Stuart, it says, does a reservation fee um, eventually become part of the deposit? Yes, it does. So in other words, the normal, if you like, what happens in practice very often is three or 5,000 euros handed over. Then the lawyer starts looking at all the paperwork and then we sign the deposit contract. We'd stipulate that you pay, you're now paying the 10% deposit minus the 3,000 or 5,000 euro that's already been paid. Okay, another question is the same, the same person. He says also, are the sellers in Spain more motivated to accept a cash offer? and versus a buyer without pre-approved uh, financing, pre-approved mortgage? Is that someone who has all the money to buy or someone who is depending on a mortgage? Well, no, it's faster. Hmm? It's faster anyway. If you've got the money in place, yeah. I think yeah. you're ready to yeah. pretty much the due diligence, isn't it, Michael? Yeah. Okay. Very, often, very often, sellers will not... Some Very often, sellers... I mean, if they've got a mortgage lined up and it can be done quickly, it's not, it doesn't really make much difference to the seller. Now, if the buyer says he wants to sign a deposit contract subject to the approval of a mortgage, very, very often sellers will not accept that. In other words, they say, no, no, you do the, we'll, put, we'll set a longer completion date, maybe five months. But if you don't get the mortgage, you lose your deposit because otherwise the seller's got no, no certainty of what's going, to get, what's going to happen. Perfect, Michael. Okay, let's go through a different question. Uh, Ignacio, Pedro, uh, we have one from Angela, don't we? Yeah, that's what, that's okay. what I want to read. Uh, Angela, Ignacio, uh, regarding the 3% retention, is when someone is a non resident as a seller, it says, hold 3% retention from the seller. Can you explain this, please? When and how do I return it to the seller? Right. Okay. Uh, okay, um, well, um, uh, is it the first one, even the beginning? Oh, the beginning, yeah, yeah well, let's go, fine. oh, sorry, let's go to, I mean, let's yeah, answer I can, yeah. I can let's do one. Do you want me to go, go okay. for it, or? Go for that one, Michael, and there is okay. one from Angela. Okay, well, well this, right. is a good, this is a good example, okay, so so basically, if you're, if you're, if you're now purchasing a property, um, and, you're, and you've got a good lawyer that's representing you, if he detects that the seller is a non-resident, he will tell you that you've got to retain 3% of the sales price because if you don't, you will be responsible for that money because the, the seller, the, the, uh, sorry, the buyer, when the seller is a non-resident, is responsible for the 3% towards capital gains tax of the seller. So the buyer, the, your lawyer will say, no, no, if the price is is a, a million, you don't pay over a million. You've got to hold back 30,000 euros, because otherwise you'll be responsible. And you've got to, and you as the buyer have got to pay that money into the tax office within 30 days of the completion. Now, the seller, and this, this person that's written to us is the seller, they will then have to get their lawyer to ask for the receipt of the 3% that was paid into the tax office by the, by the other lawyer. And then they've got four months from the day they sign the title deed to calculate what the real capital gains tax is. And if it was less than that 3% of the sales price retained, claim some of that money back. Or if it was more, pay extra money in. That's how that one, that's how that works. Okay. So that 3%, that's money on account. So these, well, these people that have suffered it, they will have to see whether their real capital gains tax is more or less than that amount. That's right. Perfect. Michael, thank you. Okay, well, let's go through this question about Angel. It's a little bit long, but I will try to read it and explain it a little bit um, before uh, Ignacio answer it. It says, I would like to buy a property in, in a place in Alicante region, and it's one of many illegal houses in the area. So uh, she knows or he knows that it looks like it's an illegal house build. It is not registered in the property registry. We already explained what it is property registry. So this property is not inscribed in the property registry and it has been refused to be inscribed three times. Um, his or her abogado, lawyer, says no problem. There are needed two deeds. 
and one lead is the ownership of a current owner and the other is the second lead which will be created whenever they buy the property and then it looks like we'll have access to this property registry this will be accepted uh, will the property be registered and legal in the land registry mm. Well, I think we all experience, uh, Angela, a lot of experiences here about buying a property in Spain in a, in a uh, difficult way, you see, because in, especially in the inland area, you could hear the problem many times, there is no problem. And, and I, I'm not saying that you could not legalize everything properly, you know, but it's just an experience that probably you're not really here to suffer and go through all that. Uh, what we uh, going through an independent lawyer and very good experienced lawyer. I know he could give you his opinion, tell you whether that's possible to legalize. But one way or the other, I wouldn't risk any money at yeah, all. Yeah, very good. Very good yeah. 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 You know? yeah. Matthew, uh, the, I think. It, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I would. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Take it here. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, do experiments, okay? Uh, which I know probably with lawyers like yourself, Michael, or yourself, you really have a clear picture of what's going on, what is the potential problem, and probably all yeah. the contingency problems. But the answer is not to spend money on these experiments, yeah. okay? And we will highly not recommend you to spend any money down. Uh, yeah, in these kind of cases. One thing I would like, I mean, once I read this question, I would like to, for Angela to understand is, okay, well, maybe because we need to check, obviously, the documents that has been done or not, if is this previous acquisition of a property uh, on a deed uh, has been done correctly, then uh, with the two deeds, we'll be able to have access to the property registry, perfect. We have some article 2005 or uh, mortgage act. That's perfect. Obviously, I'm not saying that it will happen, but if it does, it doesn't mean that the property is legal. Hmm? Mm. The property may be no legal because do not fit with the planning law of Giver. Mm. If it's a legal property, it will be keeping be a legal property even though it is in the property registry inscribed. Okay. So as I said, uh, Ignacio said, uh, don't um, say these formulas like if it's inscribed will be legal and that situation yeah. because I will spend that easy on that clear. Right. Mm. We're talking about here in in a secondhand property. But I'm going to put you here a testimonial of Pam and Jean Donnelly yeah, exactly. that Paco has now. And uh, it was a very similar case with the one that Michael and ourselves, we dealt with about getting the money back. I mean, we prefer you not to spend any money at all on experiments and to hear probably the words, I left my brain in the airplane or things like that, that we unfortunately we hear a lot of times. I'm going to pass over a video and then I'll explain to you what you need to do when you buy an off-prom property. Over to you, Mabako. Every day we spoke about it and they kept saying, how foolish. But we weren't foolish because it was another eight families. We weren't all foolish. It's just that it was so plausible. The builder had an office. We had a lawyer. But obviously not the right lawyer. We we thought we'd got a an honest builder, a German man. He seemed very nice. We got a lawyer that was telling us when we should pay the money because we didn't ever pay out any money without, without consulting the lawyer and saying, "Is this right?" And every time they came back and said, "Yes, pay it." It was quite a, a period, about a year or so, when we had completely abandoned hope and that's uh, and that was when um ignacio came on board mm. and then he said i can get it back for you but where there's a possibility quite a good possibility of going after the banks because he had done previous cases uh, similar cases and been successful Okay, um, actually, uh, Michael, Pedro, and myself, we dealt with a lot of cases. And as I said before, this was the typical case, Angela, and, and the ones who are in the similar situation. But when you buy off plan property, the developer, right, is requesting you to pay, please pay, pay me some money, right? So you start with the 5,000 probably, or three, or whatever he asked, right? 
then he start the difference here in this case is state payments state payments so they start asking you okay i'm going to build the house of your dreams here which is beautiful in inland giver uh, actually this case from from pamela and jim was in Beniardech, i believe and um they were requested again rustic land no license unfortunately not good due diligence and start paying money but they never asked for the due bank guarantees in spain buying a property in spain off plan uh, is safe but you must request and not to pay any money without the bank guarantees that's really what protects your interest and in case of bankruptcy or failure of the developer so what happened exactly is they end up and the cases that even recently michael and myself dealt with they spent on hundred thousand euros with no bank guarantees and after that the problem is no license right no license so what happened here is that is they always started getting silly answers about i'll be there i'll get the license you know it's taking time the town hall etc etc but you already pay the money and that's what you don't need to do you see uh, and and the case that probably angela is saying he's similar if you start paying money is is not good so what happened was they went bankrupt they started it was a case of uh, 10 families or something like that this development and they start criminal action against the developer because of um, obviously lies etc etc and fraud asking for money knowing that it was not legal it ended up in court in a criminal case but the criminal case probably they put him in jail but nothing happened now what what we did was starting and suing the bank for not issuing the bank guarantees but all these we're talking about many many years many many years you don't need all these so as i said here when you buy an off plan property number one always a good lawyer that helps you to save money that's the whole point and get everything by the book and number two make sure your money is protected okay so uh, i don't know if michael wants to add something about it with the cases that with uh, um mr mr porter that we went through michael yeah well We've had lots of experience claiming uh, on on properties with bank guarantees uh, on stage payments. Uh, basically, the experience is that we already knew back then, but now I think everyone's learned the lesson is that if you buy a property under construction, you must get your bank guarantee. I mean, a bank guarantee, so people understand, we call it bank guarantee and it makes people confused about it. Basically, all it is is an insurance policy, but it can actually be issued by the bank or it can be issued by an insurance company. But it's an insurance policy, and you have to make sure that each time you make a stage payment, they actually issue you physically by email, or whatever, but with the actual policy, the guarantee of that amount. If the builder's not gonna do that, then you shouldn't make the next payment that's coming after that one. It's obligatory by law, and it's up to you to make sure that you've always got all your bank guarantees lined up before you make the next, uh, next payment. Um, I just want to quickly jump in. Can I just mention something about Angela's question? Let's leave you with a bit of concern. Yeah, Michael, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So Angela, who's going to buy this property, what she's being told, in other words, that it's an unregistered property, but you've got two title deeds with one year's difference. I can do, basically, they're going to do a 205, what we all call a 205 on it, um, um, she needs to realize this is an exceptional procedure and it can it can have problems. In other words, she hasn't got the guarantee of the thing. Even if they have those two documents, she signs the deed. Yes, it, they may be able to register it, but there's not 100 percent guarantee. They may be able to if they if they've got those two successive title deeds with one year's difference. But even then, when it gets registered, it gets registered with a quarantine. It lasts, I can't remember if it's one year or two years. In other words, that registration is only valid uh, against the person that sold the property to her, not against third parties. So somebody could come forward, even if she manages to register her title deed, four months after, somebody else can say, no, I had better title. These people just fabricated those deeds and, and I've got better title to that. 
What I would do if I was her, if she's got doubts, the first thing is, is this is a transaction that in my view should not be for a normal consumer, only for an investor. An investor that knows what he's doing, can make a, make a, 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 a risk assessment, I mean, they're buying below the price, et cetera. The, 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 what she needs to do is this, go to a bank and say, I'm gonna buy this property, can I get a mortgage? Well, 95% chance is that she will not get a bank that will mortgage that, that, that property that she's buying because of it is going to be subject to a 205 in the best of cases. That's, that's what I, so as I say, in our case, our recommendation to somebody that wants to buy that property, unless they're literally buying something for half price or, you know, it's the whatever, and then they only want to look into it, our recommendation would be to not purchase that property. Yeah, I like what you said, uh, Michael, and I agree with that. I mean, obviously, this is has a risk. I mean, we, we didn't say about this two years time that is going to be painting this inscription in the property registry. And obviously going to take some risk regarding the labels or someone who's going to say, I have a better title or my boundaries are these ones are not that ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be like a, a, as an investment, if someone offers you a really good, good price and you can plan with your lawyer perfectly yeah. this kind of types yeah. of investment. That's, yeah. But obviously there is a risk and you need to plan and be sure what kind of risk you are entry on. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, please carry on sending us your question. We are having a many and there is one here from John that uh, I think we cover in our yeah, last in the last, last seminar, seminar exactly yeah uh, he was asking us whether there was a way because he's uh, John is saying that there are Americans they, they're from the US they're willing to retire very soon is there any way to part some money in euros while well, the exchange rate is so good for us in the meantime I know Pedro of currency exchange companies like the one yeah that we interviewed last yeah, that's last right. that's time right they really could book that. I think it was about 10%. You need to buy 10% and the rest, you could book that exchange rate until one year, which I, I found it very, very good, actually. Uh, but John, yeah, we could put you in touch with this company or even shop around. Uh, but yes, the answer is yes. There is a way for you to book that in advance. And I think it's very wise, yeah. isn't uh, it? That, that, I mean, right now, there are a lot of Americans that are investing in this space. Yes, a lot, a lot. Um, lot. And obviously, the, the dollar right now is very powerful. It's great, and actually. Great in exchange it's great. With, the, with the euros. I mean, in the Costa Blanca, and I assume even Michael also in, in Andalusia, Americans are coming here because probably of the a, of a flights are uh, uh, better. I mean, even moving to Mexico, maybe yeah. so. We've just got a new flight into, into Malaga from New York. We've just got a new weekly flight from New York into Malaga. Um, oh really? Oh, uh, yeah, the, the American yeah. market is incredible at the moment because remember they're buying almost twenty percent cheaper than last year based on the exchange rate, uh, and so the perfect package for them: they buy a property of over five hundred thousand euro, they get their golden visa, and they lock in the the great exchange rate. And if they buy in Andalusia, we have the seven percent transfer tax until the end of the year, which on on on, on expensive properties used to be ten percent. So. Right. Perfect. OK, That's well, fine. now that John has it, these questions, uh, you have introduced the, the words tax and, and well, residency. Let's let's talk about let's first start with the entrance door, which is to how to become resident in Spain. We have already uh, speak, uh, spoken about buying a property in Spain. Also could be a possibility, as, as, as uh, Michael said, that maybe also renting a property and see around the area, maybe just uh, before you decide to buy property in Spain. But the entrance door uh, to be resident in Spain is we have like, two different uh, parts that we normally recommend is the non lucrative visa, the non working visa, and the golden visa that will be explained by myself. Ignacio, a good would you be able to give us some uh, like um, important issues regarding the non working visa? Because right now, I mean, uh, many, I would say many of Americans or I mean, also in the, from UK are applying for this kind of uh, visa. Right. OK, now uh, um, everything actually, uh, just please send us on the chat if you have questions about visas and then we could just uh, answer to them. Uh, there is an another one uh, with tax Pedro. We will get into exactly. it, which is very much related about the relocation property, exactly. relocating in Spain. Um, so just please send it all because today actually is the only day that we're going to try to spend two hours if you still have questions. So none of the uh, assistants and audience are going to be with uh, without an answer. Now, Pedro was saying 
basically, Ignacio, I want to move to Spain. What do I do now? Uh, right. There is two ways, and I will try to be brief, okay, because otherwise um, I don't want you to get bored with it. And now, uh, Paco, just follow me for a second. If we go, if we go, let's say you decide to come to Spain, make an offer, spend three months, Andalucía, Costa Blanca, anywhere in Spain, and you make an offer, you buy, et cetera, et cetera, right? But you still don't have the residency permit. Some of you might want this property as a non-resident tax, which you could plan in advance. And I always think it's a good idea to do it little by little, so no rush, no stress, and we could do tax planning and immigration planning, Pedro. For example, are you retiring in Spain? Uh, right, you've got nowadays two type of visa, which is the non-lucrative visa, the golden visa, right? And there are more visas, but probably you could concentrate because there is coming one about the nomad visa, but we will do a webinar as soon as is being released, I believe, January, okay? With a special taxation and normal visa, people working remotely. Even though I don't want to get confused, but with a non derogative visa, you can still work remotely as long as a property, as long as you work for a, a broad company, okay? So for the non lucrative visa, the requirements, you need to stay more than 180 three days, for example, more than six months. And let me get you here clear. Immigration is one thing, tax is another one, but it's very, very connected, okay? Differences, and just don't forget this. Tax system works from January to December, right? And then to be tax level in Spain, you need to spend more than six months, right? Now, type of visas, that's tax, okay? If you need to do tax planning, you need to buy a property in Spain, you prefer uh, to take things little by little and buy the book, I probably recommend you to start looking into property, coming as a tourist, looking around, and then going back to the US, to the UK, to wherever your home country is, and do the non-lucrative visa. We could help you with that, so you don't, is stress-free as long as we can help you from the very beginning, okay? Otherwise, it gets very complex and you don't want to be in a situation of a stress because of the dates. Now, non-lucrative visa, you must stay in Spain from the day of your arrival, more than six months, right? Okay. I don't want to confuse you today much, but if you come after the 1st of July, right? And your first non-lucrative visa will be one year, but you start in more than 183 days in a calendar year, right? So this year, you will be non-tax resident in Spain, even though you will have a visa to stay in Spain for a year, right? So I just need you to understand, and, and don't worry if it's complex now, we could discuss that over the office or the video conference, whatever. First thing you need to do, apply whenever you want to become resident, apply for the non-lucrative visa through proper uh, people that knows all the process and uh, helps you all the way through. But important as well, do the tax planning because you don't want to get for a visa if your tax situation is not good for you. So it's very important we do tax planning before. In the meanwhile, that you are making a decision to go for the non-lucrative visa. Now, the non-lucrative visa is requesting per couple minimum 34,000 euros in the bank, free disposal, health insurance, no criminal records, uh, register here eventually as a resident, okay? And not working at all, right? You might have some issues with the consulate because the consulate wants to make sure you're not working for anybody, right? But there is doctrine and we went through the, the courts and definitely the non-locative visa, you could work still um, for an um, off, um, offshore uh, company or abroad. Right, golden visa. If you're really committed to buy a property over for 500,000 euros, then this is the one for you. But 
if you're going to come over to Spain to buy a property, just shop around, appoint a lawyer. Uh, and then once you complete, as Michael stated, and the notary office, then we apply for the golden visa in a later stage. That means that let's put this property, these 500,000 euros in one person time, and the beneficiary, like husband and wife and children, will take all the benefits from this golden visa, right? This golden visa, we can lodge it from Spain while you're here, okay? The non lucrative visa, we cannot lodge it from Spain. It has to be from the Spanish consulate abroad, okay? Important things to make decision, Petra. Uh, the NOMA visa, I will still, we have in a website, if you go into a website, a little bit of information about what might be coming, but I prefer to leave it up in the air a little bit until it's being approved, okay? Because that's a good rate of taxation, a good visa to work remotely. But I think it will be like a non-lucrative visa, more flexible. It will be a combination between all of them. Yeah. Uh, that, that's that's what I think. Let me give some topics about this nomad visa. Yeah, go ahead. If it's, if it's just... Okay, well, what we said it's about this non-working visa. Uh, working visa, what it is the most important Thing, and it was created really for uh, retired people. It is that you are not allowed to work, as it's been said by Ignacio. And you are not allowed to work in Spain, but there are many resolutions that shows that you are able to have some work uh, and work through uh, companies outside of Spain. That is, it was in a limbo. And right now, this new Nomad visa, which is going to be approved in the following weeks or months, uh, is going to uh, create a situation where people will be able to come to Spain work in the different companies outside of Spain, not with companies in Spain, or at least, and this is what it says, the project of this kind of, uh, of um, law that do not get income more than 20% of the worldwide income that comes into this person. But it's gonna be really good, as we have in Spain and Europe, I mean, this Beckham law. Um, and it's gonna be for third part, third country citizens, which has not resident, you will be taxed 40, 24% of income, it looks like, and this is a project, so take this into account, it looks like it's going to be reduced for 15%. And it was, this situation was created in order to have a benefit for five years, and it looks like it's going to be extended to 10 years. So it's going to be a really attractive situation for nomads, the people who work in companies outside of Spain or wants to start a business in Spain, obviously we have to demonstrate um, they have a capabilities, the technical experience, and obviously these situations is not gonna be as uh, like simple, but it obviously looks like it's gonna be a perfect scenario to attract uh, self-employment, people that want to be, uh, keep being as an employee in companies that they work outside of Spain and can be into Spain. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, important things for non lucrative visa and golden visa and as well will be with a normal visa. Well, first thing, no, no working visa and golden visa, financial means. You need to show that you have you have enough money to live in Spain. That, that's uh, important. Uh, with no working visa, you are not to work in Spain through a Spanish company. With a golden visa, you are able, you're authorized to live in Spain. You can just be one day or you can live 365 days. You are allowed to be resident in Spain. Uh, but you have to show that you have money or enough money to live in Spain in case you do not want to work in Spain. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is the minimum amount? It's 27,000 euros as one person, and then it will be every family member will be 7,000 euros. For example, a marriage couple will be 34,000 euros, 24 plus 7,000 euros. Then important issue, so financial means. Then important issue is criminal records. And we apply always, and we need to add an application the um, uh, criminal records certification that shows that you don't have any criminal records really. Mm -hmm. Okay, for the last five years, and that's important. And also, and also another important document is, is the health um, um, insurance or health uh, right to, to have access to the health system in just Spain. Mm -hmm. Normally what we recommend is the first year um, with the NUCA divisa, remember is one plus two plus two plus five, Mm -hmm. And then the golden visa is one plus two plus five. So this first year that starts, also with the golden visa could be started through the two years at the beginning. But with this first year, we always recommend to have access to insurance policy for a private insurance company. Mm -hmm. We work with 
uh, with Mafre, which is one of the most reputable companies in, in Spain, but there are several other ones that also are good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Petro, I have a question for yeah. you. Could I buy a property as a, a non-resident, as a tourist? Okay, because John is asking here, is it possible to buy a property on a tourist visa mm -hmm. and then in a few years apply for non-lucrative visa? Absolutely, absolutely. For the non-lucrative visa, uh, the main important issues are these three ones that I said. Is financial mean you need to show that you have enough money to live in Spain. Criminal records and the insurance policy at the beginning. There are obviously there are some other requirements like medical certification, the passport, but these are these are the three main points. Obviously, if it's a marriage couple, you have to show the marriage certificate. If it's included the descendants, children, also the birth certificate. But you could buy a property as a tourist, as a non-resident in Spain, and then uh, some years after to apply non-lucrative visa. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And also with a golden visa. What if someone bought a property some years ago? Could it be added or could it be applied in cases more than 500,000 euros investment? Obviously, yes. And from, um, I always forget the, the date exactly. This is from the 29th of September, uh, 2013. After that, every property which is bought uh, can be included in, in the New Holland visa. Mm -hmm. And think about it, it has to be an investment over 500,000 euros, could be one property, could be 10 properties, could be as much properties as you have, but needs to be over 500,000 euros altogether without any mortgage. You need to show that you have spent this kind of, of, of money. Pedro, uh, okay. Graham is asking, what is one plus two plus five referring to with regards to health insurance? No. Uh, one plus two okay. plus five referring to with regards to health insurance. Could you please clarify for him? Okay. This is a one plus two plus five. I've been assuming for the golden visa. This is the period of time when you apply for golden visa starting is you start for one period, one year period of time application. The authorization to be a resident in Spain as an investor. And once the first year has passed, you have like 60 days before, to apply for a renewal. You could also do it after, really, with a fine. But let's say that doing by the book, doing 60 days before is a renewal, you start the process of a renewal. And then you apply for two years. Uh, for the Golden Visa, important is to maintain the investment. Mm -hmm. Maintain the investment, it means that if you bought property or properties, you maintain them or use, maybe you can sell some of them or one of them or the property that you invested and then buy another one, which you maintain the investment, or maybe you sell the property and you deposit 1 million euros, for example. Mm -hmm. When we say the health insurance, we say that it needs to cover, needs to cover the year that you are being authorized to live in Spain. Mm -hmm. And obviously, when it's to make the renewal, you need to be authorized for the following two years, you need to cover, show that you have um, authorization uh, at an insurance company that will happen for the following two years. Mm. Okay. Pedro, who can apply non-lucrative visa? Only people from USA and the UK? No. Well, That's a question the, from Hung here. Yeah, we didn't specify that question, but obviously for the non-lucrative visa, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a the, the route really for immigrations, there are like, I always say there are like two queues. One queue is for European Union citizens, and the other queue is like general, um, rules, which is non-European you know, citizens, and the non-working visa goes through, through that route. So, first thing you have to have, uh, you are, have to be citizens of a of third country, non-European country, non-EU country. And that is the you need to have a, this kind of uh, that's passport. If you have a passport from UK, from US, from Canada, that those countries are non-European Union countries. The European Union citizens that has a passport from European Union citizens go to a different route. And the requirements are uh, more flexible, I would say, more uh, soft. Mm -hmm. Pedro, if uh, Adrian is asking, if I stay less than 183 days mm -hmm. and I am under the withdrawal agreement, okay, uh, do I need to do Modelo 720? Um, do we have to do uh, to be fiscal? I think they're getting confused with the uh, Brexit, which is an immigration thing with the TA, and the tax. 
Could you please explain uh, to Adrian the difference between uh, the tax and the immigration so it's clearer? Okay, uh, Adrian, thank you for the question. And um, let me see if I can explain it in a, in a simple way. And okay, Adrian, what I understand what has been said as or said is that it has the, the under the withdrawal agreement has been acquired the residency into uh, the Spanish immigration system with the withdrawal agreement. Okay, these 180 days is a general rule that we have under tax law in says that from the 1st of January of our year, natural year to the 31st of December, if you spend more than 180 days, you are tax resident, hmm? okay? Let's put an example, this is the year 2022. We are right now on the same October. Hmm? And well, let's put, let's divide the year into two semesters, first semester and second semester, okay? If someone uh, lands into Spain and starts being resident in Spain in the first semester, it is a presumption that is going, to, is going to spend more than 180 days in Spain, so will be a tax resident. And in the other way, if someone starts being resident in the second semester, it looks like, and it is a presumption also, that has spent or is going to spend less than 180 days in Spain. Okay, having said that, and this is the general rule, 180 days is one of, uh, of the main issues. What we said about the normal visa, for example, it says it's going to be taken into account as a non-resident, and it's going to be taken into account that obviously the situation about the central uh, uh, area place because the companies are outside in Spain is outside. So it has this argument in order to be taxed in Spain as non-resident with some benefits that become low. But in this case, if you are resident or not, it's gonna it's gonna be taken into account if you spend more or less of one hundred and eighty days. Mm -hmm. Okay, Pedro, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Adrian is saying that he understands about the one hundred eighty three days, but he wanted to know if it's different if we buy a house. Um, I mean, buying a house is a criteria that can be done by a non-resident. By resident, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, buying a property in Spain, you can do it as a non-resident as a Tourist uh, visa has been said by it doesn't matter if you are not resident and Michael will be able to explain us about this non-resident tax when buying a property as non-resident mm, mm. because it has a property a, a small tax but it's something that needs to be done uh, that has nothing to do if you buy a property it does not mean that you are resident in Spain it means that you are you have you are an owner of a property in Spain mm, that's all mm. okay it will be nice yes. Adrian if you tell us and people when they send us the questions. You tell us when you, where you're from, so we can understand whether you're European, non-European, and what specific situation. Okay, let me finalize with this explanation, just a couple of minutes more, uh, because it, it was, what says about something about Modelo 720, I think it was say something about Modelo mm. 720. Mm. Mm. Modelo and fiscal. Okay, so if someone became resident this year, which is 2022, because I spent more than one eighty days, then the following year, which will be next year, the first three months from 1st of January to 31st of March, we have to make a Modelo 720. What is a Model 720, Ignacio? I mean, a Model 720 is a, is a Modelo you need to show and inform tax office about your assets worldwide or outside of Spain, which in three pillars, property, investment, insurance, which are value, well, deposits, sorry, by uh, bank accounts, uh, where the value altogether is more than 50,000 euros. You need to inform about that. Mm -hmm. And then in May, June, you have to make your worldwide income that you had in the past year, mm -hmm. okay? If you became resident in the second semester this year, even though you are resident, let's say today in October, you are not resident that year, 2022 your tax obligation will start this year, through this year, 2023. So this will be the case that Modelo will have to be done in the three months and the worldwide income will be 
in May, June 2024, about 2023. Mm? So you always work one year behind, exactly, yes? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, okay. Pedro, shall we pass over to Michael to explain to the yeah. question, uh, how does it work, non-resident taxes in Spain? Michael, over to you. Thank you, Ignacio. Pedro, great, great explanation. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to say, following to the non-resident tax, is something that really may really sound like a silly thing, but we, we, we've been asked, we get asked every now and again. So I want to clarify it. Um, those people that want to purchase a property as a non-resident, sometimes they say, oh, well, I, I don't want to put down a deposit until I know that I'll be able to get my NIE number, because I've heard that without an NIE number, I can't purchase. I don't want to lose my deposit. Okay. Um, unlike the, the visas, the residencias, and all these things that, you know, they could be more or less difficult depending on your circumstances, the NIE number for a non-resident is a non-issue. In other words, if you want to buy a property in Spain, don't worry, your lawyer will be able to get you your NIE number, which is your non-resident uh, your non-resident number so that you can purchase the property. Okay, so after you've purchased the property in Spain, your lawyer will probably sit down to you to find out whether you want to become a resident, whether you're going to remain a non-resident, if you're going to become a resident, the different alternatives that you've got, golden visa, non-lucrative visa, etc. Now, if you simply decide to remain a non-resident, well, there's two things to consider. One is the immigration uh, uh, situation. In other words, if you're a resident of the EU, National, you've got no problem at all. National EU, you can become a non-resident and stay as long as you like. If you are from a non-EU country, then you have got this limitation of only 90 days for every 180 uh, 80 days. Okay, so with that immigration thing out of the way, uh, let's go into the taxes as a non-resident. If you're a non-resident in Spain, and you own a property, typical example, a couple, they open up a bank account, they buy a property in Spain, they come out here every now and again, they don't rent it out. Their situation is very simple. Their lawyer will set up electricity, water, rates, rubbish and commutative owners by direct debit on their account after they have completed the purchase. The only other obligation they will have is once a year, they have to file a non-resident imputed income tax return. This sounds a bit strange, but basically what they do is they take the value that appears on the rateable value of the property, the catastrophe value, which is always much lower than the market value. They consider that you make an income of 1.1% of that and then tax you at 24.75%. To cut a long story short, if you have, say, a, a 300,000 euro flat in Spain in joint names, once a year, your lawyer or your accountant will write to you and say, time for the non-resident imputed income tax. Your tax bill will probably be between the tax bill and your accountant's fee or solicitor's fee. You'll probably pay maybe 500 euro. That was anywhere between 300 and 700 euro uh, between tax and fees on, on a 300,000 euro property. So it's no big deal, but you will have to make a, uh, you can't set it up by direct debit. You have to make a presentation of a return every every year lots of the solicitors that handle conveyancing offer this service in-house and then you can after you purchase you can either do it with them or do it with anybody with anybody else it's not rocket science but it does need to be you need to do it with someone that's sort of fairly organized that's going to be able to have the copies of the receipts in their office for when they're needed okay so if you rent out the property things get a little bit more complicated not much more but a little bit if you rent out the properties a non-resident, every three months, the next 15 days after every three months finish, you have to present a return, declare the days that you have rented out the property. Uh, and then if you are an EU citizen, you can deduct any expenses that you've had on the flat and then, and then they apply the tax rate and you pay your tax. If you are a non-resident of the EU, so British people, for example, uh, now you have to present the gross income that you've received, manifest the days that you've rented it out and pay your tax on, on, on that. And if you're a non-resident of the EU, pay at a rate of 24% of the gross return of the rentals. So that's the unfortunate bit. You cannot deduct expenses if you're a non-resident of the EU. 
So at the end of the year, so you, your accountant will be presenting this return after the end of every three months. So uh, January, February, March, in April, the first 15 days, he makes the return for the first three months. He does that all the way through the year. And then the following year, the, your, your, the same accountant will say, now you've got to present your non-resident imputed income tax. If you rented it out part of the year, we, we only pay the non-resident imputed income tax proportionally, because we'll only pay it on the days that you didn't rent it out and pay real tax on real earnings. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. In other words, if you're going to be an, if you're going to remain a non-resident in Spain, the tax situation is really very, very simple. Uh, as a resident, it becomes a bit more complex. And I think Pedro is going to go through all the obligations you will have as a tax resident in, in Spain. Okay, well, thank you, Michael. There is a question I would like to answer before we go entering the tax matters, uh, Ignacio. Uh, is regarding uh, Oliver. Thank you, Oliver, for uh, joining us and thank you for asking us this question. No, okay, sorry, are... sorry. Either, either I didn't say it correctly or this client didn't, or this person that's put a message here didn't hear me correctly. No, you can only deduct expenses if you are a resident in the EU. If you're a non-resident of the EU, therefore including Britain now as well, uh, you now cannot deduct the expenses. I'm not sure, maybe I maybe I say it the wrong way around, or maybe not, I don't know, but the client here, I've confused him, so <laughs> there you go. Okay, let me firstly answer uh, Oliver. I mean, if you say you are an Irish uh, citizen, if uh, there is any advantage of having a non the visa, well, as an Irish citizen, you will not get a queue of, uh, of a third country as a citizen. It will go to a European Union Queue yeah, yeah, and everything yeah, we yeah. will get um, a more flexible uh, requirements in order to obtain a residency in Spain. Mm? Yeah, actually, uh, for you, for the Europeans that they are listening now, uh, they will have to prove once they come over to Spain that they've been living in Spain more than three months with a minimum of nine thousand euros for the first applicant, and you obviously uh, need to prove financial means, as I said. Uh, health, uh, health insurance and be registered at the patron, which is at the town hall of the property, whether it's rental or ownership, it doesn't matter, uh, mm -hmm. about um, what, what we call it patron, right? And then we lodge it through a form and it's a completely different system. It's pretty much straightforward. Uh, but um, And even UK citizens that prove that live in Spain before 2020, uh, they are still entitled to lodge that, but obviously the yeah. evidence uh, is not straightforward, and then we might end up going through the courts and fighting. But it's worth trying if you're one of the UK British um, British nationals who were living in Spain before Brexit, and you carry on living, and you still don't have your residency card, you're in the same position as the Irish, the any European uh, citizen. Yeah, and also, I mean, Oliver, you will be, I mean, nothing to do with a non lucrative visa, non working visa. As a European Union citizen, you will be able to live in Spain and work in Spain. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, Pedro, shall we move okay. on? Pedro, Pedro, let's, I, let's move. Uh, Pedro. Yes, Pedro. Hello. Um, can I just ask you a question? Because lots of clients are asking us, and you're expe an expert in this field, so you could give us maybe the final answer, or at least we, if you don't know, then we know that nobody knows. And that is, with the 720 form, that's the Declaration of Assets Abroad, to be filed by uh, residents in Spain. They've got more than 50,000 euro in, in you know, the cat three categories, etc. Now, we've all heard about the, in the press, etc., about what the, you know, the sentence of the European Court of Justice told Spain, what they thought about this, uh, this declaration, etc., and how, you know, that the penalties were all declared illegal. Uh, but lots of clients are writing to us asking us okay michael but where does that leave us you know do i do we have to make the return now do we not have to make it what's your your view on this uh, uh on the 724 okay well the 724 I mean, obviously we are gonna we are not going to explain right now the history history that happened because of these threatened fines that we had before obviously right now things are a lot more let's say easier but it's an obligation it's still an obligation that has to be made by those who are residents in spain and has and uh, assets outside of Spain, mm -hmm. um, which covers, as I said, the three pillars, as I said, um, more than 50,000 euros, for example, when it was acquired, they own a property in the US or in the UK. 
And uh, well, um, it's, the property was acquired over 50,000 euros. Or they have some uh, bank uh, um, uh, accounts that all together is more than 50,000 euros. Or they have some investments, an ISA or a, um, uh, some insurance policies, some, uh, um, well, there are many, many financial uh, structures like SIPP or um, many of them, which is over 50,000 euros. Why this is important to be done? Obviously, because if there's an obligation by tax uh, office in order to, to do it. Mm? Obviously, if he's not done, could be able to be a fine. It's not a big fine, but it will be a fine. Mm? And obviously, just to fulfill other requirements or on, on tax law regarding once you become resident, you inform. Um, regarding what information do I have to, or this investment is not, it's not clear to be included or not, it's something obviously you will have to discuss with your own lawyer, with your own tax de department of any firm that you may choose. But it's important to do it because obviously there are some obligations also in, in, in most of the regions in Spain. And obviously we, we can speak also, um, Michael, about Andalusia. There is a wealth tax in most of the uh, uh, regions in Spain. And in Valencia area where we are, where Ignacio and myself are, there is an obligation. So. Regarding the information that you're going to give, obviously it's going to be attracted into the situation where you need or not to inform about uh, wealth tax, which is another tax that we will be able to, we, we can also entry on that. Um, I would like, Ignacy, if you could explain why someone or what, when someone becomes resident in Spain, what should be the obligations on on tax matters? Mm? Right, um, pretty much like income tax. Exactly. Tax, yeah? Let's, say, let's connect income tax with Model 720 with uh, maybe wealth tax. Right. Okay. Uh, I know is a, is a complex is a complex uh, feel, right? Which I'm going to share with you now on um, for you to read it because this is quite complex and we will not have time. But let me give you a little bullet points for you to know about and. Um, as following the advice from Pedro and Michael, for one of you... Sorry, Ignacio, who... Ignacio, Ignacio, yeah. Ignacio, before you dive into the you know, detail of, say, the income tax or whatever, could you just tell us what taxes are involved for a resident once they become a resident? What taxes are involved? Right. What, are you talking about income tax, Michael, no, no. or in general? In other words, right. a person becomes a resident in Spain, what taxes does he need to be aware of? And then, and then you, I know you're going to go dive into the income tax uh, explanation, but just so they know what taxes are involved. Right. If you're a resident in Spain, what you need to face is declare your worldwide income. Okay. Um, that means income from work, income from capital as dividends, interest, et cetera, et cetera. For you to know, uh, if you stay only, so when we, we are making the decision of buying a property in Spain, as we said, first, you could be non-taxable in Spain, okay? Whether you've got a visa or you don't have a visa, that's a different matter. You could make a decision, and that's all planned and is all legal, as is all correct, to be a non-resident tax player here, as Michael stated and explained. So that will be only paying taxes if you've got property in Spain, um, according to the EB. Right. If you decide to go the other way around and you say, I'm going to stay in a calendar year, more than 183 days. First, we need to know from what country, what is your home country? Are you, are you from the UK, from the United States, from Australia, from Canada, etc.? You have a dual taxation treaty, so you will never pay double. Then two, you will pay it on your capital, right? That comes from income from work, rentals, investments, etc. right? Any income, any, any money that generates a, a revenue for, uh, for you to live on, okay? Now, we could do tax planning and to give you a rough idea, if you, on pensions, let's talk about pensions, uh, only receive, or you don't go over 14,000 euros um, from abroad. And I think this year it is going to be changed, it's going to be raised a little bit. Um, uh, you will not end up paying taxes, okay? 
This is general rules. I will share with you the, the article about because probably you will be selling a property. For example, good point. Um, are you selling the property while you are non-resident? That's excellent decision. Now, are you selling when you are a fiscal resident in Spain? Wow, we need to be careful here. Um, was it the main property? Um, do you sell it within the two years? You will have to invest that property money or that money from the property within another two years to be exempt and you'll need to spend the same amount of money. Otherwise, it will be taxed as capital gain tax. Now, capital gain tax will be taxed from 19, 21, 23, 26, right? Income tax return, it will start from 15% and is sliding scale in Spain. It will rise a little bit in different regions, but it could go up to 48%. And then we have on top of that, the wealth tax that is only applicable in every different region, depending on your income. I know it's a very thick um, uh, and general subject, and I highly recommend you to do tax planning. So, because you really need to know your answer, not everybody else's answer to get confused with this. Now, important, if you don't have over 14,000 euros, I'm very positive that you might not, and you don't have any other income from work, rental, investment. Now, Renting a property in Spain is tax efficient in Spain because if it's long term, you're only going to pay taxes on the 40% of the net. So that means income minus expenses, that net figure, only 40% is taxable here. But now the rental only from Spain. You could be renting in the United States, you could be renting in abroad in the UK, etc., and declaring it here, that income minus expenses, minus the tax you paid over there. Okay, a lot of clients don't know, and I think this is good for you to know. Now, um, we said about wealth tax. Now, wealth tax, I will not like to bore you too much. Michael will tell you uh, all the goods and benefits in Andalusia, how good they are at the moment. Uh, <laughs> but every year is a different story, so we'll see. Uh, wealth tax in Alicante, in Costa Blanca, at the moment, you have an allowance of 300,000 euros on the main property per person, tax-free. And on top of that, you have another allowance of 500,000 euros per person. On top of that, there is a combination between how much money is your income tax return. So you could get allowances, um, a reduction on even up to 80% of the tax. But, and I will share with you the sliding scale for you to understand a little bit, how much tax would it be? And obviously the, the, the key is the combination between the income and the wealth tax. Uh, in some of the cases, um, a lot of people do not need to be worried about the wealth tax. And for those who go over the limits, we could sit down and talk through and, and find out what is the efficient way from a legal point of view. Michael, I don't know if you want me to run through uh, the EB in Spain or something else, or you just meant income no. and wealth. Yeah, income, wealth, and the declaration of assets abroad. Uh, so they know they've got three things to, to think about in there, in there, so that people don't forget. And also, I forgot to mention before, because as you know, in Andalusia, um, Andalusia we don't have wealth tax anymore. That, but of course, in other regions, uh, you, you do. Non-residents, unless they're in Andalusia or in Madrid, they if if their assets are worth more, assets in Spain are worth more than seven hundred thousand euro. This is per person. They would also have to make a, a, a wealth tax return at the same, you know, at the same, uh, as well as the non-resident imputed, in, imputed income tax return. But most people don't right. in other in any region because obviously you know it's that first seven hundred thousand euro in most regions is exempt anyway. In Andalusia, it's exempt. Mm -hmm. Right. It is important, as I said, Michael. It's always good people to do tax planning because I could be scared of the news. I could be scared of what yeah. uh, yeah. the bar says, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Great thing to do. Go with the lawyer. Do your tax planning. Do your simulation. Full stop. Yeah, and right. then you know what to do and how to work from it, okay? So I wouldn't panic. Now, I'm gonna pass over to Pedro because we're gonna jump on to inheritance tax and wills, which is an important thing. We run through property, we run through visas, taxes, 
Now let's talk about Pedro. Is it important to make a will in Spain? How about inheritance tax planning? Over to you. Okay, thank you, Ignacio. Well, let's let's give up uh, some tips about why it is important to have a will, why it is important to make estate planning, and and when someone becomes resident. Well, we have a, a European law that says that in general, to have some articles, it says that whenever you uh, become resident, whenever you are resident in, in a European Union country, the applicable law, whenever you die, whenever you die, will be the law that you are resident. So if someone becomes resident in Spain, it will be, in case it is not changed, will be a Spanish law. If someone be, uh, becomes resident in France, will be for France a law. What does says a Spanish law about inheritance? Okay, well, uh, this time, for example, I'm married, I have two children. I cannot give all of my assets to my wife because two thirds of my assets goes to the descendants, two thirds. And one third, I have a liberty as a Spanish uh, to give it to some to whoever I want, also to my wife. For example, this is an example. This is a real example. Also, there are some uh, rights of, uh, we call it the uh, right to use and join um, your, uh, but this is the main rule in Spain. So when someone becomes resident in Spain, um, if nothing is changed, if nothing is done, will be a Spanish law, unless you expressly say that you want your national law, your passport law to be applied in your inheritance, which means basically that you will be able to choose whether it is a Spanish law or whether, whether it is your national law to be applied in your inheritance process. One of the main things in a, in a, in a will, obviously, is uh, who are the beneficiaries. And uh, this is why we always recommend, well, so whenever someone becomes resident, to make a will. Why? Because, well, there are different scenarios. People have uh, different, for example, children with different marriages or do not want to leave things to children or do not want, but whatever uh, circumstances or whatever arguments, you need to know that whenever you become resident in Spain will be applied, applied. In order to choose the beneficiaries of your inheritance will be applied Spanish law. And to change that, the best option is to make a will. A will to be made in from of a, nat of a notary. We already explained what is a notary, which is a public, um, uh, let's say a public um, um, uh, office in order to, to do that. This, this is what we normally recommend. Well, 99.99% of the circumstances we say to do it in a notary, obviously through the recommendations of, a, of an expert lawyer. Um, but basically this is the, the situation on a wheel. Why do we um, uh, recommend always to make a wheel? Well, uh, there are situations, and, and Michael is an expert on, on wills and probate, uh, also in the UK. I'm sure that he will be able to, to, to add some, some, some other uh, recommendations on, on, on wills. Okay. Um, yes, well, for the last 27 years, that's been my main, main line of work, and that is handling probate and inheritance-related uh, litigations. So without any doubt whatsoever, no doubts, whatever you read on the internet, if you buy a property in Spain, make a Spanish will. It's very important for many reasons, but I'm going to just uh, uh, insist on the subject that Pedro has touched on, which is extremely important, very easy to solution, sounds complex, but it's very easy to solution with a Spanish will. Okay, so what is this? Well, basically when we talk about a will, there's, there's the issue of the inheritance tax. We'll put that to one side for one moment, forget about it. And then we talk about the civil side of things, in other words, what you can do with your inheritance. Each country has set like a set of norms that say what you can do with your inheritance, who you can leave to. And all, each country has also got a set of international laws that establish which law is applicable if there's an international uh, element. OK, so basically in England, uh, you can leave things to whoever you like. You can leave things to the cat's home if you want. It's no problem. So English people don't sort of think about along the lines of what, could there be a law that says what I can do with my, my inheritance? But in other countries like Spain, there is. So in Spain, the law for Spanish people is that if you have kids, basically two thirds of your estate have to go towards your children. This would be a big problem for us uh, British, because obviously we may want to leave everything to our spouse in the first instance, and maybe the children are only in the second instance. Okay, can we do this? Yes, 
we can. Why? Thanks to an instrument that the EU created and that Spain has accepted as their own international norm. So under that international norm in Spain, if you don't say anything in your will, they will automatically apply the Spanish law to determine what you can do with your estate. And that would make you subject to all the limitations that a Spanish person is. But all you need to do is make a Spanish will and put this clause in it. It's a clause that says, conforming to Directive 650, 2012, I choose my national law, in this case, for example, English law, to determine how I can distribute my estate. If you put that clause in, from then on, then the rest of the will can be to do whatever you want. You can leave everything to your spouse and then second step down to your kids or whatever you have to do. But you must put that clause into your Spanish will. If you do that, there's no problem. And then, so going on from there, that's, that's the main reason why you need to make a Spanish will. And even if it wasn't for that, you should always make a Spanish will. If you have to rely on an English will to wind up a Spanish estate, you'll have to pay a lawyer like me about double the legal fees to convalidate and make that English will valid in Spain, et cetera, et cetera, with all the problems, delays, and mainly the, the expense. Um, and then regarding the inheritance tax, inheritance tax is something that uh, you need to talk to a solicitor about before you handle the purchase in Spain, because inheritance tax can be very different uh, in the different regions of Spain. As in Nathio and Pedro point out, this is a changing issue. In other words, Andalusia is one of the best regions in Spain for inheritance tax now. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's always going to be the case in the future. But for certain people, depending on their circumstances, there can be, especially for very high net families with special circumstances, uh, there can be a lot of difference between the regions regarding inheritance tax. Not for everyone, not for normal families buying a small property, but if you go into the high net families, uh, where you buy in Spain can actually end up making a big difference depending on who the beneficiaries of your estate are, are going to be. So when you book the initial consultation about buying a property in Spain, and especially if you're a high net family, also talk to the lawyer about inheritance tax, etc. I would like to point out also something else, and that is that in Spain, the probate process, if you've got your will in place, is very straightforward. So when you're buying a property in Spain, one of the things that you're concerned about is, well, you know, is it going to be a problem I'm getting on? If I buy in Spain, is it going to be easy for my wife to inherit the property and things like that? It's very, very easy. If you get your lawyer to make a Spanish will and you do it correctly, uh, when it's time to do probate, within three months, everything can be can be wound up. Um, and that's it. <laughs> that will. Uh, Mark, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you one video about experience about people living in Spain, and then we're gonna answer the few questions, Michael, that we have here. And I'm gonna pass over to Paco. See whether he's on. Over to you, Paco. my father died intestate so it opened a whole can of worms because he had a, he had a property in Ibiza a property here in Albia and we had the inheritance tax to sort out in six months which as Len said the the solicitor in Ibiza wasn't we thought he was dealing with it as as my father's solicitor but he didn't so Ignacio and Roberto they took it on for us and um, sorted it all out um, and so many things that, that the pile of paperwork was just getting higher and higher but they they have been absolutely amazing um, taking the pressure off us taking the stress off anytime you want to phone them they're always there if you email them you get a reply straight away uh, just I can't say I'll speak hard enough no absolutely amazing but I think what made it more complicated as well was because um because dad died intestate and my sister had died, um, but left uh, an heir, she had a son who was in England. So it, things had to be divided between me and, and my son, who obviously is not resident here. So they, they had to organize things for him as well. And so it hasn't just been just straightforward. No. And also it helps, they speak perfect English. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a great video, and this is why it's important to 
to plan, to make a planning, to make a will. I mean, obviously, to 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 be well advised are, are regarding uh, um, inheritance wills. About I mean, we have spoken about many things issues, but this topic is, is extremely important. Even though, as he says by uh, Michael, it's simple to 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 do it. It's um, extremely simple in order just to do it and and well have everything peace of mind. Mm, I agree. I mean, not having a will, it could only generate problems and cost you more more stress and more issues. Actually, I'm going to share with you, Michael and Pedro, today, being at the notary office today. And I just thought, because in this worldwide where everything is with the internet and we all have so many codes, Michael, uh, you know, bank codes, uh, even uh, cryptocurrency, all, all these kind of things that you can have. Uh, you are just the only one who knows that. Yeah? That's correct. I mean, nowadays, Michael, I'm sure you will you will share that we all have so much information that we only know. And if we pass away, probably my wife, nobody else knows and, and it gets lost. So speaking to the notary today, I said, how about doing obviously the will that you, you suggested and another will with an envelope with instructions or whatever things you need to leave. Obviously, you could have that in a safe. That's one way. And the other one, a client of mine was requesting this thing, saying, well, you know, I have accounts in all around the world. I have um, information that not necessarily um, anybody in my family knows, and they will not even have yeah. a, a, an idea what to do with it. So I said, well, how about if we do what we call testamento ferrado, right? What we call is like another... Uh, like an annex to that wheel with an envelope that nobody else... Uh, it's like a closed envelope. A closed envelope with instructions, and you can have it even there. Um, and uh, there is a possibility for him to take it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been arguing over these things. Well, Michael, nowadays, with all so much information, I think it's important people only, not, not just to do the will, it's just to leave instructions to the executor, uh, to, to the family, because uh, otherwise everything gets wasted. He just said, in Africa, they wouldn't know what to do. And, and I'm sure there is so many of interstate uh, wills, uh, well, of interstate situations, a lot of money in the bank lost for, uh, forever. You know, nobody knew that I had a bank accounting, who knows, in, in the US, you know. Um, I just would like to share with you this because I think we should uh, go always further on these things, uh, even though... The safe ways to having the safe, but uh, it's not a bad idea, is it? I think it's an important idea. I mean, it's good. I think it's a good option in the two because there are some codes, like let's say Bitcoin, as an example, of, and many codes that we have, and it's extremely private. And yeah. uh, even though obviously they could come to us and we include it in the database confidentially as lawyers, oh, why not to include some it information made, yeah. in the close envelope that will be open by the beneficiaries. Yeah? It made me think, Michael. Uh, it was a person with no children, no family, everything left to probably sisters and brothers, but they're not going to know where all the business uh, these people has done. And it's a pity just to leave it everything all ruined because nobody else knows. And I just said, this cannot be right. You know, it cannot be just for the state or just to get lost in the bank. Let's call it repossession uh, uh, money from the bank. And it made me think, yeah. you know, it made me think. Uh, I don't know if it came to your thought, Michael, this, this kind of thought. Yeah, it's always been a problem. If you go down just to the Spanish, uh, in the UK, there are uh, systems to allow people that, to, to, the way to hunt for bank accounts for people that have passed away. In Spain, as you know, there's a central register for life insurance policies. They, all the policies are registered, but there's not, there isn't one for banking. And the notaries for many years have been trying to uh, uh, reach an agreement with the banking institutions and the government for it to for there to be a system whereby the notaries can do an automatic search of all bank accounts in the name of a deceased person all over Spain. And it's the banking institutions that have always refused. So all that tells me is that there must be some money that ends up disappearing in the coffers of the banks. Um, and then obviously mm. what we see, what we think, we always sort of get the feeling that with things like, you know, Bitcoin, I bet you anything you like that Bitcoins get lost because uh, nobody knows the codes. Um, uh, I mean, we've even had a case with someone that thought that there was some gold uh, uh, buried in the garden somewhere, you know, and nobody knew where it was. They just heard from a girlfriend of the of the of the father that there may have been some gold somewhere. Uh, you know, you, there are there are strange things that happen. So people uh, do need to leave a list 
somewhere, perhaps in the, tell their spouse that there is a safe somewhere with uh, the paper. I don't know. It, it's it's difficult because who do they trust with that information? Um, but, but it is a it is a problem, and um, and we always, you know, when. Uh, the trouble is that in the old days, there was always like paperwork lying around the house where there'll be bank statements that, you know, at the end somebody would find. But nowadays with all the internet banking, the, you know, yeah. we, we sit there with the, with, with, with the, you know, with the widow and the, and the kids, and we're all sitting there with a laptop, a laptop that nobody knows how to get into. Nobody knows the codes. And this person has not received any bank statements for years, you know. So they, they know of an account in the UK in Barclays. But could he have another account? Could he have something else? Uh, we've come across sometimes people that, that were not aware of, of shares that were in their parents' name. And they like two years after the estate has been accepted, they've received like a letter in the post to, to, to go to the annual general meeting. And we've realized that that person was a shareholder of that company with a lot of shares, et cetera. And then we've been able to retake that subject and, and, and deal with it. But I think that um, especially people that are sort of international people, they've lived in various countries and are moving to Spain, they're slightly detached from their family. And in those cases, it's, it is it's very easy for our assets to go unclaimed. Mm. Okay, perfect. Uh, we are starting to be run out of time. Let's answer some questions that I think we are left. Um, let me be uh, a little bit rapid and run on them. Um, uh, thank you, Oliver. I think you made another question after the last one you made. And it's regarding, well, let me let me give you the principles. I mean, if you, even though you are a EU citizen and an Irish and you live in the UK, even you have a property in Spain and you are renting the property in Spain, even though you are EU citizen, but you, as you are resident in a same country, the payment as non-resident tax will be 24% gross, okay? Not deducting anything, okay? Okay, uh, question from John. Thank you, John, for joining us and watching us and also making these questions regarding um, US retirees, our IRAs, a four, one k as we now, well, and the social security, including tax computation, all of them are included in the wealth tax. And obviously in the worldwide income that we say, it will have to be included in worldwide income and will be able to be deducted as a double taxation treaty, Spain and the US, the payments that you do regarding social security. And, and the wealth tax will be included, the IRA and the Roth IRA and the 401k, 401k included. Okay. And uh, from uh, Stuart and Kimberly, thank you very much for joining us and, and, and making a question which I understand is a to, to clarify about uh, properties and residences. Yeah, I'm going to read it. Yes. Yes. There is an advantage of landing, if, to landing in Spain on a non lucrative visa, then purchasing a property as non tax resident in the same year, but becoming tax resident in the following year. Um, are there taxes uh, to avoid or advantages? Well, um, to obtain a non-lucrative visa, you don't need to buy a property, but buying a property in Spain as resident or as non-resident, it doesn't give you a benefit in order to on taxes or buying a property, mm -hmm. okay? What it is important is the year that you become not just resident, also tax resident, so in, which means that you've been living in Spain more than 180 days in Spain, I know this is a little bit difficult to, mm. to understand. Obviously, um, um, Stuart and Kimberly, please contact us and we will have a video conference with you and we will try to explain it in a, be, a little bit more um, calm yeah. way. But if you spend more than one, eight, three days in Spain, then you are tax resident. You become in the second semester, as you say, you will not be tax resident. Important issue is that you're going to buy a property, but the money, for example, you're going to get it from an investment, which you may get some capital gain during the year that you are non-tax resident in Spain because you will avoid any capital gains tax in Spain, mm -hmm. as an example. So, I mean, there are some other issues regarding if you sell your main home in, in, in your country and then you reinvest it in Spain will not be taxed, yes. But um, to buy a property will not be any benefit if you are resident or non-resident or tax resident or non-resident. Mm -hmm. will be the transmission tax or value tax in the different regions that we have spoken in, in Andalusia or in this case in Costa Blanca. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Angela, 
Uh, thank you again, Angela, regarding the impact minimization license and will be implemented. Obviously, the legacy legislation has been implemented in many uh, areas in the Valencia region. And, um, but I, again, repeat, obviously this is a very specific point, but it doesn't mean that it's easy to in the property registry will be legal. You need to take into account that the property is gonna be according to planning law legal uh, and one will be restored in a legal situation and will be in a situation where it's not out of the planning law which means that you may don't have any right to for example build a swimming pool or build anything you would just have a right to maintain to make a, some conservation uh, of the property which which it's a little bit more limited in order to have a property mm -hmm. Uh, but obviously, Angela, I, we, the recommendation that we do, we, we give you is, is to, well, minimize all these points and be, be sure careful. you be careful, be sure what you are buying and, and uh, make all the questions to your lawyer in order to absolutely know what you are buying and which are the limitations on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's say, um, um, Michael, there are some, uh, uh Questions by Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. He says, we have official UK wheels. Do we need fresh ones in Spain or can we, can the wording um, about this European Act 650 just be added to it? Uh, no. The, I mean, they, they can make a will in the UK and say it's for worldwide assets, okay? And then, of course, if it was necessary, uh, if some time comes, we could use, we could then convalidate, et cetera. But as I said before, and I can't say this enough, there is no doubt whatsoever. You need, if you have assets in Spain, you need to make a Spanish will for your Spanish assets. It's in the best of cases, simply half the price uh, to, to deal with a Spanish will than it is if I had to convalidate the UK will. But in addition, it's going to cause a lot of problems with the time scale uh, uh, because we have to what the, the English will has to go to probate in the UK before we can even initiate the procedure to combine it over here. And very often the English wills cause tremendous problems to combatate. For example, if an English will mentions the word trust, and they often do because it's a very usual institution to use in the UK, those wills create all sorts of problems in Spain when we have to convalidate them. Why? Because trusts in Spain don't exist, okay? So there's no doubt at all, make one will in each country where you have assets and make sure that you make the solicitor in one country aware of the existence of the others so that they all make sure they don't end up revoking the other wills. Uh, it's, it's not rocket science, it's very simple. Don't go against the current, uh, we see some very, uh, uh, I'm going to say silly, if you're not saying stupid, uh, 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 comments on the internet saying it's it's uh, uh, by by the odd lawyer in the UK saying, oh, it's perfectly possible to deal in Spain using the English will that we will prepare for worldwide assets. Yes, it's possible, but it, it, it's more expensive, a longer procedure. There is no doubt. One will in each country will save you a lot, lots of money. There is no doubt. Okay, thank you, Michael. I think we've done uh, this two hours uh, yeah. webinar. Obviously, we have spoken, uh, we have informed you about uh, buying property process, about the immigration issues, about the non-working visa, about the golden visa, about the nomad visa also that is going to happen. And we understand it's going to be an attractive visa also in the, in the near future in Spain. We have spoken about taxes, also about being resident or non-resident. And we, well, mainly we have a, a answered many questions. Obviously, there are some questions that has not been answered because we have no time right now. Obviously, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. We obviously thank you. And we will like you to well, send us some emails. Say there is an email from Ignacio and Michael and myself. Please send us email and know that if some question has not been uh, uh, answered or you would like to more information in order to make like a video conference yeah. with us, Please send us all these uh, emails. I will be happy to to answer them. I don't know if you would like Michael or yeah, Matthew. Yeah, I would uh, like to thank uh, everyone for joining us. I think we we have many many people here. Uh, actually, uh, we have Stuart, um, Oliver, Angela, Graham, Francis. Uh, you know, Adrian. A lot of people here. Yeah. So thank you for your time. It's thank the first you. time we did two hours yeah. of our time. I, I think. 
Uh, we did it just for you because a lot of people have a lot of questions. We did cover a lot of topics. I'm going to give you some homework, okay? Some homework for you. Do things by the book. Seek independent legal advice. Try to do planning and try to take advantage of that peace of mind that you will end up having. Buying a property in Spain is safe. Doing things properly is safe. Um, I just encourage you to come, pop in to the office, see us, uh, or just uh, see us in the next video. Thank you, Michael, for spending the two hours of your time as well. Uh, we really appreciate, but I think it was good value. We cover uh, everything in this very limited time, but I think it's like a little um, video for you living in Spain. Uh, we're going to just share now uh, the very latest video about uh, flying with us over to Spain. And if you still have questions, just ask Alexa. Alexa has 100 questions and answers for you, which we did download it. Um, and then one friend is going to explain to you how to click. I'm going to say goodbye now. I'm going to just let you fly over Spain and learning. If you have more questions, send us emails or again, ask Alexa. Okay, over to you, Juan Frank. How to buy a house in Spain as a foreigner. To buy a property in Spain in accordance with the legislation, the first step is to check the legal situation. What taxes do foreigners pay in Spain? In total, there are five Spanish taxes that every foreigner is obliged to pay. One. How are inheritances regulated in Spain? Inheritance tax is a progressive tax. Where to apply for the Golden Visa? The first thing you should do is go to the Spanish consulate in the country where you live. There you can request all the necessary documentation to obtain it. You can't stop thinking about it. That hidden cove, just for you. That little hideaway in the mountains. Or that beautiful postcard town. Dreaming about enjoying the fresh air again. Feeling the sun on your skin. Exploring walking. Traveler, there is no path. Paths are made by walking. Never stop dreaming. Spain will wait.